this is uh, hot off the press, uh, so hot that the paint is still dripping. Uh, the reason for that is the IETF leadership is actually meeting right now. And so over lunch, I was getting the updates and updating the slides over lunch as to what would happen this morning. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's how hot it is. All right. BPF's documentation standardization process. So let me first provide some history as to where we were before I get up to this week here. Um, and so the discussion of standardizing BPF, like the ISA and so on, in the IETF, there was two main issues that had been brought up at some point in the past, right? Joel Halpern from Ericsson is one of the IETF trustees, right? The trustees is those who, uh, the IETF trust is what owns the intellectual property or the copyright, if you will, on IETF documents, okay? And so the trustees is the one that's their job to look out for what the legal requirements are, are around um, IETF standards, okay? So he is one of the IETF trustees, and he personally raised uh, two issues uh, about trying to standardize BPF things in the IETF. One of those was basically that he believed that it was out of scope for IETF, right? Because it's not, you know, networking stuff that goes across the wire, right? The second one was that he believed that there were legal issues in bringing BPF work to the IETF because the Linux kernel used GPL, okay? And so that was all prior to IETF 116. IETF 116 was March 25th through 31st. There's a link in the slides. You can get to the proceedings. You know, there's the video. There's the... Uh, um, uh, slides and everything else, so if you're interested in what happened in detail, you can go back there. But I'm going to give you the summary here. So there was a couple of events that happened at IETF. There was a hackathon that a bunch of us were at, where we had a table um, hacking on BPF stuff, including the documents. Um, there were various other groups at the hackathon working on other you know, networking technologies. Several of them were actually using BPF, and one of them we actually had a meeting together between the BPF table and the other table to educate them as to how to best use BPF for their scenario. Uh, so that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Um, we then, on the Sunday morning, we had a meeting between the IETF leadership and the um, various BOF proponents, which is a couple of the people in this room, right? Alexi and David and myself were there, and um, we explained the legal state and the IETF's lawyer uh, was like remote on the screen or whatever, where we explained here is what the various licensing around the actual documents and the code and answered questions and so on. And we came away from that saying that where the lawyer was confident that there was a way forward, the lawyer provided a statement that the uh, BOF chairs could use in the BOF, and I'll talk about the BOF on the next slide, uh, or at least one of the next couple slides. So they provided a statement saying, okay, there's going to be some way forward, we'll work it out, don't worry about it type of thing. Um, uh, don't worry about it for purposes of the BOF, right? BOF being birds of a feather stands for we're gonna try to propose work in the IETF, right? BOF is the formal process if you're not familiar, to say to propose a working group. So then we had the actual BOF, um, which was the, the actual meeting to propose, here's what the charter for doing the work in the IETF would be if it gets approved. That BOF was chaired by two people, one of whom is uh, Suresh Krishnan, who is the past area director over all the internet area working groups, um, and Lorenzo Politi, who does the Google Android um, implementation and could talk about BPF there. So the two of those were the ones who chaired the BOF. Both of them are very familiar with the IETF process um, and were seen as sort of you know, neutral moderators and, and did a great job, I thought. Um, and so I'll talk about the outcome of that in a minute here. Um, we then had a hack demo, um, which is, you know, hack the hackathon, anything that gets done in the hackathon, you could have this table or, you know, presentation about this cool demo you guys did or, or uh, whatever else happened there. And so we did that and we handed out, you know, things like these stickers and flyers you saw up here and answered questions about BPF and just advertised stuff in general. So that was great. Um, it's also worth noting the IETF plenary, right? The entire, you know, big, uh, across the entire IETF, there's like a thousand or more people in the, in the room or whatever. BPF actually got a special mention by the IETF chair. Um, it was uh, used as a, a, as a positive joke, just highlighting the importance of BPF. Um, not a technical discussion, but hey, you know, any mention is a good mention if it's not negative, so. Um, and then later in the week, we had a side meeting, meaning not an official IETF meeting, but it's there at the IETF venue with all the IETF people in it. Um, where we actually worked on some charter text. Okay. So that was what happened during that week of March 25 to 31. Busy week. So how did the actual BOF meeting itself go? Okay. Well, there was over 100 attendees in person, and it was hybrids. It was more remote, and I didn't count how many people were there remote. Um, out of those, I think it, at least half of the 
uh, BPF steering committee was uh, part of the meeting, um, as well as uh, a significant number of the actual IETF leadership came to the BOF to, to weigh in on the topic. Um, and uh, the purpose was to propose that we standardize cross-platform BPF specifications. Okay? There's presentations, right? Alexi gave a presentation, I gave a presentation, Lorenzo gave a presentation, um, all great stuff. And then we opened it up for discussion, or I should say the chairs opened it up to it for discussion. Um, the chair showed that statement from the lawyer that had been prepared on Sunday that said, any discussion of legal stuff is out of scope for this BOF. We'd like to have a technical discussion here uh, because the lawyers are going to work out the legal stuff when the lawyers aren't in the room, and so any legal stuff was out of scope. And so nobody could bring that up. Um, any of that would happen out of the actual room. And so the rest was on the, the technical discussion and whether it was actually in scope for the IETF, okay. um, which was that other uh, maybe you know, uh, issue that had been brought up before. Uh, oh, and by the way, um, a, after the BOF, I ended up talking to, to Joel, and who had also reached out to his lawyer, and apparently he got a similar answer from his lawyer, too. So um, everybody went forward during the week under the assumption that the legal stuff would get worked out eventually. Um, and so during the BOF, there was a discussion about should it be in the ITF, right? Is the ITF the right place for it? Is it in scope? Um, can it actually work I as far as the process goes and so on? And it turned out that there was actually overwhelming support for doing it in the IETF. Okay. In fact, out of the 100 or so people, there was a whole bunch of people that came to the mic. Um, two people, Joel and one other person, argued against it, and everybody else were strongly in favor of it, including people that are usually detractors and beat up on just about everything. Right? They came up and said, let's do this. Right? And so it was actually surprisingly positive for, for those of us that have been in IETF and lots of these BOFs and stuff. Um, this was like you know, almost as positive as you can get in, in, in a BOF, and so that, that was actually really nice to see. So it was overwhelming support. Um, the IETF chair, Lars, even, you know, got up on the mic to talk about how, you know, the IETF's mission is to remain relevant, you know, as more and more protocols are implemented in sort of dynamic code things. And so, you know, if, the, if it's not in scope, we need to change the IETF scope to remain relevant was basically his argument, right, that says, and BPF was actually central to that mission, right. And so arguments like this sort of carried the, the, the way in terms of the consensus. So when the, the chairs called for consensus at the end, there was, uh, I would say, strong consensus that it should be done in the IETF, right? Because, uh, you know, we said, well, we could go somewhere else or whatever, but no, 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 the IETF wants it there, we want it there. And so um, the, there was very strong support. And so the, the de facto assumption was going to be, yes, it would happen, it was just a matter of when, and when would the legal stuff get worked out and so on. So that's where we ended the week with that kind of on a positive note. Um, uh, just step back for a second. What is the actual process that the IETF uses to create working groups? Okay. So the decision owner for whether a working group is created is technically a particular sponsoring area director, right? IETF has area directors over different areas, right? So it's two area directors for security and two for routing and two for you know applications and so on. And so uh, different technologies fall under different areas naturally, and one of the two area directors over that area um, becomes a sponsoring AD and is the proponent for, yes, I'm going to approve this thing or I'm going to not approve this thing. In this case, Eric Klein is the sponsoring area director, um, and he's the other one that has, uh, that over lunch, he, he's uh, reviewed all these slides and uh, approved these slides here, including the stuff that I'm quoting him on later. Um, and so the, the process for working group creation, it requires a couple things, right? The area director is supposed to have community consensus that the, this is the right thing. Okay, we actually got that at the BOF, so big check mark. Um, he needs a set of uh, chairs that are willing to do it, and IETF uh, precedent or, or, or normal approach for chairs is there's at least one senior chair that's uh, familiar with IETF process for years and years, and maybe one chair being trained that's familiar with the technology. Okay. And so that was done here, Suresh Krishnan being the senior chair IETF expert, and David from this community um, will be the uh, chairs once it's approved. And so that all happened during the week, in fact, uh, was uh, the recruiting of chairs and discussions among them. So thank you, David. Um, and so we ended the week with that part checked off. Uh, then a charter to vote on, um, because in order to approve something, there has to be an official charter. That's like the contract between you know the IETF and the proponents, and you do this, and we'll actually publish it as a standard, that kind of thing. And so um, there was a draft um, that was done prior to IETF, and in the side meeting, we did some editing on it, and I'll show you that uh, in later slides here. Um, and so that's what will actually get voted on, which is the point five here. 
Um, in many cases, the legal part is irrelevant, but in this case, it was decided that we needed a legal okay, that we needed the lawyer to actually say, yeah, I don't see any issues here, right? And so uh, some of the process was stalled based on number four in between IETF and now. Um, and then uh, after one through four is done, then the area directors actually vote um, at a formal meeting and just minutes it, and it requires something like, I didn't look it up here, something like two yeses and at most one no. Right, and most of the area directors are saying, this looks fine to me, no objection, I'm not the expert in this area, right? And so that's why two yeses, something like at most one no, and we don't think anybody's gonna vote no, right? And in fact, they met this week, and even Eric doesn't think anybody's gonna vote no. It'll be yeses and no objections, it's the expectation anyway. Okay, so that's the process, and we're kind of in the middle of that process. So now we're gonna get to the hot off the press part. You ready for it? Okay, progress on legal. Last night, at about 10 o'clock at night, uh, the lawyer sent his legal written analysis to Eric, the IETF chair, the IETF executive director, and me. Uh, and since it's AC privileged, I can't forward it because that, if you know those of you that know AC privileged, you're not allowed to do that. Um, but I can tell you the impact on us. A and again, uh, this slide has been okayed by both Eric and the lawyer. Uh, and so everything on this slide, I'm confident, are perfectly fine to relate to all of us. So basically, the, between Eric, the IETF chair, the executive director, and me, who are all on the thread between 10 p.m. last night and uh, about a half an hour ago, um, all of it, everybody's confident that it looks good, that there are, in fact, no legal issues here. Um, I will make one wording tweak to the uh, internet draft, so I took two documents, uh, the ISA and an ELF um, specification, and created internet draft versions, which are formatting as, uh, as an IETF input, okay? And I had done that before last IETF, and I had an acknowledgement section about who it was actually authored by, where it was copied from, and the Linux repo, and that kind of stuff. And he suggested this wording tweak, and I said, yeah, great, I'm happy to make wording tweaks, right? Pretty trivial. Um, and so I'm gonna make that wording tweak into the uh, acknowledgement section in the, uh, uh, in the draft format, and I'll talk about the derivation part on another slide here. So the IETF note well, which I'll tell you what that is in a minute here, but that's basically the IETF rules that are on the legal aspects of contributions. Okay. And so we actually talked about this at IETF. This is one of the discussions we had in like the Bach and the side meeting and so on. It says, um, how do we make sure that those contributing document changes in through, say, the Linux kernel repository patch to contributions are somehow aware of this IETF note well that their text is gonna be used in an IETF document? Okay. So the idea that was floated among people at, at, that, that attended IETF was, uh, well, actually, I'll get to that in a, in a later slide, I think. I think I got somewhere there. Um, and so the BSD license is, of course, uh, okay, but if you read the BSD license, it talks about code and software as opposed to document text, and so you have to kind of squint a bit, but the intent is clear, right? And so it's the, the, the belief is it's perfectly compatible with what the IETF note well shows, which I'll show you later. Um, and so all of this that I'm reporting out here had, was also discussed like uh, two hours ago at the, IETF, uh, at the IAB IESG, that's the IETF leadership. They're at the retreat in Seattle right now, all in a room sort of like we are, right? And the same stuff was talked about in there this morning, right? And so uh, I then got to update this one that says it has been discussed and they were okay with it, right? So that means all the people that are actually gonna be voters have already seen everything that's basically in these slides, right? And they're okay with it, right? So that's why we expect it'll be yeses and no objections and there's no nos because that would have come up this morning anyway, so. And, and it would have come up probably in the meeting that a lot of us were in there on the Sunday at IETF, and so that's why we're pretty positive. That there is in fact um, already a, now a, so that, that point about go ahead from legal, we can now say a big check mark on that point three. Done, that happened today. Okay. Um, then Eric, who's the person who actually gets to make the decision, right, and send out and, and put out the vote into the, uh, into the IESG. Um, gave his thumbs up, and here's quotes from him, and he helped uh, um, uh, approve this slide like an hour ago. Uh, he says, uh, we've received a thumbs up from council, that's what I reported on the previous slide. Uh, he said that the proponents, that's us, uh, should review the proposed charter, see next slide, uh, to see if it's ready for broader review, and some steps that Eric will take, and form the trust of our intent to proceed, that's basically responding to Joel, saying, yeah, we're gonna do it. Um, and not just Joel, but it's, he's one of the set of trustees. He was just the one that was speaking up, so. Um, and form the IESG of council's review. I think that's what he was doing this morning, like an hour ago, or two hours ago now. Um, and then uh, the goal is to vote on the charter at the next telechat, which wasn't in the quote from him. The next one is May 25th. 
They meet every other Thursday morning, and since they're at the retreat, like this week, so it won't be tomorrow, but it'll be two weeks from tomorrow. Okay. And for some reason, if we want to delay, then, it would, then the next one after that would be June 8th. Okay. But assuming we're ready, then the last check mark, that, that point 0.5 on that list here, will happen on uh, May 25th. Okay. If we ask them to delay for some reason, then, then it'll be uh, June 8th. Okay. But that's up to us, not up to them. They're happy to do it on uh, the, the vote on uh, May 25th. And at this point, it should be a formality. So. Yeah, so this is, I, I'm excited to see what else you have fresh off yeah. the press, but I just want to say that if uh, we probably don't want to delay, so yeah. we should probably come up with some um, some policy where essentially if you know you don't say anything by May 24th, yeah, yeah. whatever is in there is going to be what we propose yep. to the uh, the area director. So if anybody's interested, we should send it to BPF at also um, and you know expose it to the community, but yeah. I don't think we should assume that like, we need official sign off from anybody. Like what's there is there, so yep. just FYI. And to be clear, the, the charter proposal, so there, there's the link if you open up the slides and you click on proposed charter, you'll get to the stuff that I put on the slides later uh, that I just copied, cut and pasted there. Um, that proposed charter, the only person that can edit that proposed charter is Eric. Okay. Anybody else can send Eric suggestions, but technically he's authoritative for what goes in there. He can just decide, and then other people get to vote and either accept or reject that, but technically everything else is input to Eric. He would do an edit if he agrees with it, and then they'll vote on that. Okay. And so, by the way, he was there in the, in the editing meeting and editing live, and so he's very amenable to changes. If we want him to change stuff, he's happy to do stuff. So, Is, is there, sorry, I might have to sneak in a second. <laughs> is there, um, like a, a way that, like what's what's the workflow like for proposing changes to Eric? Is there like a PR that you can make in a repo or something or? Um, I think that there is, but the si but probably the fastest way to do it is just post a piece of email to the bpf at ietf.org list. Okay. Uh, with like the diff, and so that's probably the fastest way to do it. Okay. And especially if you're change a a asking for addition of like one line or you know reword this to this or whatever, that's the fastest okay. way to do it. We, we should, yeah, I mean, not to be repetitive here, but we should probably yeah. send an email to BPF at Vigor explaining all of that, pointing yeah. them at the yeah. repo with, a, with a, the thing. Well, uh, I would say we should send an email to BPF at IHF.org, of which BPF at Vigor is a member, and so it'll automatically go there. Right. So the point is, all the discussion on this goes to Vigor and wider, and so don't send it to Vigor, send it to BPF at IETF so it gets the wider, so it gets both the IETF proponents, and basically the IETF leadership people who are on that list, plus the BPF community. Um, so I'm not going to show you the, 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 what that proposed charter says, okay? So in other words, I unless we send them feedback, this is what's going to be voted on here. And keep in mind that we would prefer to not delay it. We'd like the vote to be there. And so um, if you have some, gosh, it would be better if, then it's better to just say, yes, could I live with it is a better uh, way to phrase it. Could I live with this or is it something that I couldn't live with? Because if you, if you want some tweak or whatever, if it's going to be arguing about it, we don't want it to delay the vote, right? So if you can live with it, then it's good enough. Okay. So there's uh, three slides so that it would actually fit here. The first one is just background on what I eBPF is. Uh, the most important part is the parts that I personally bolded on the bottom. Um, that is, what is the working group going to do? It's going to document existing state. It's not going to invent new stuff, right? It's trying to document existing state, okay? And a process, not the technology, but a process for extensions. Let's say you wanted to add a new instruction, what is the process for doing that? So the ITF is not going to come and add new instructions or something like that. It's going to say, here's the process for doing so. Okay? And it's going to document what's already out there. Okay? That's what the initial scope is. Could it do other stuff beyond that in the future? Yes, but right now it's scoped to document what already exists. So, yeah, uh, John. Yeah, just one, one comment. Uh, Alex, you told us it wasn't a sandbox on Monday, and uh, the charter has the word sandbox right there. So don't know. Can you live with it? <laughs> Feel free to suggest a text change. If you think it's non-trivial, it'll be accepted. Just make sure it's, d it's in there by the 24th, right? Universal assembly language doesn't work either because it's not just the, I the ISA, so <laughs> yeah. we'll brainstorm. So the point is, later. get some review. You don't have to review it during this, during this meeting, but if you got thoughts right now and you want discussion, right, we could get fast resolution right now if you got something. Okay. So that's point one. Can I go on to the next one, or anybody else want to stare at that longer? Okay. Uh, I'm going to go on. Okay. Going once, going twice. Okay, point two is what are the specific work items out of the working group, okay? And the point in the italics on the bottom is my own, my, my own text because that's where I have a comment, okay? So these are the things, uh, so I had a list that I presented at previous ones like at LPC and so on. I think uh, Alexi had a list that I think was presented at IETF if I remember right. And so this is a derivative of that because this is what we edited during that side meeting and here's the current list, right? And so like the other day somebody asked about would we standardize the ABI and you can see right there in the middle the platform support ABI is right there on the list, okay? So it's the ISA, 
verify our expectations, BTF, ELF uh, profile, uh, PSABI, cross-platform app types, cross-platform program types, and some architecture that's just how, to, how the other documents fit together. Okay. Dave, do, do you not want to discuss what the community thinks about whether any of this is in scope here? Because it might be a good time for folks, um, now that we're at it, y If you want, sure. Since, since um, uh, I'm filling in, uh, I think we have time, but I guess that's up to Daniel. I guess my only point that I would want to make is that um, I think it would be very difficult to talk about map types without talking about how you could actually create maps and read and write from maps. And so that's why I argue that um, you got to have something that's some type of uh, helper functions to do map lookup and update. And maybe you put that into the same bullet as the cross-platform map types itself, or maybe it's a separate bullet. That's the only gap I know of in the entire text. That's my only comment, is somehow fill that, or at least have a gentleman's agreement that the interpretation of that is map types and ways to interact with maps, right? Yeah, I mean, everybody should just think about what they consider like core BPF and what you would or would not want standardized and yeah. speak up before yeah. the 25th, it, ideally. It, it, and we've said that this list that this list of bullets is intentionally in order, probably by order in which they have to be done because lower ones depend on higher ones. And so you start at the top and work your way down, okay? And so um, the, the charter actually will have uh, milestones, which are like, you know, back of the envelope that you're not held to dates, and the expectation is these uh, bullets are in chronological order, okay? Not necessarily, that you have to finish the first one before going to the second one, you have to finish the second one before going on because you could have overlapping dates, but the deadline for them is, is usually in this order approximately. Okay, that's the expectation. And that's what a number of us talked about at the side meeting, right? Okay. Not me. This is a test. <laughs> this is actually an emergency. Okay. This is actually an emergency. We'd have a working group already. All right. L bottom of the text, this is the last part of the text, okay? The working group shall actively engage the eBPF Foundation and all major users of eBPF, that just means work with communities like this one and, you know, eBPF Summit and et cetera, uh, to ensure inclusion in the IETF's consensus-driven process. And the working group was intended to only work on cross-platform aspects of eBPF that are useful to the wider internet community and not operating or otherwise platform-specific. So if there's something that's going to be inherently Linux specific, it doesn't have to be part of the standard that IETF goes into. But if you want it to apply to say, you know, Linux and Windows both, then yes, it should go into and be discussed in the IETF, or at least be part of the documents that are in there, right? So you can imagine splitting stuff into a core document, an extension document, which I kind of already started doing in the upstream into instruction set .rst and Linux notes .rst. We already started doing that split for exactly this reason. Suggestion for wording thing for yeah. the all major users of eBPF. I mean, I guess it's fine, but the I e feel like we the BPF community. Yeah, yeah, sure. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Disagree. <laughs> okay. So if you have a specific wording suggestion you'd like, post it to the list. I, I, if you think it's not worth arguing about, that it's close enough, then eh, then don't care. Yeah, uh, just one question on the so the, the cross uh, cross platform. I think. We're trying to express that it's explicitly out of scope to uh, standardize things that are platform or operating you know, system specific, but uh, does that also exclude uh, a mechanism to define uh, uh, platform specific? Uh, no, it doesn't. And so that, that was exactly what, uh, going back here when it says a process for extensions, that's partly what that includes. A process for extensions in say subsequent standards that says, okay, and here's the extension for networking or for storage or for memory or whatever, you know, uh, scheduling, you know, whatever. The, but there's also the, the process for like vendor extensions. Is it okay for say, you know, Red Hat to have a Red Hat specific extension? Is it okay for Microsoft to have a Windows specific extension and so on? And whether the answer is yes or no, this is the place that gets to say whether the answer is yes or no. And if the answer is yes, here's the process for doing it to make sure you're not colliding with somebody else's, right? You can't just take an op code and just use it because somebody else does the same thing and now you have collisions and we don't want that. So what's the process? You either can't do that or here's the process for doing that that prevents collisions, right? And so that the, the, the working group would be chartered to actually decide the answer to that and write it down. Right. And then the last part that's not in there right now is that those things that are back here, there would be rough dates for, and just culture, the, 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 the dates 
people always overflow the dates and stuff, and then they update the dates later. So at least you need the first set of dates. It's in some order or whatever, but they don't hold you to them. Um, but having dates is better than not having dates because at least people have a goal, and people can give other people a hard time if they're not keeping the document up to date or whatever. So, All right, so that's what's in the charter, and so this is what would be voted on or a derivative of this on the 25th. Okay. So this is the call for anybody else that has this. Please read if you have anything that you need fixed before the vote. Uh, post it to the list long enough before so they can have uh, so that Eric can update the proposed charter text so that when it goes up for vote on the 25th then hopefully it will just say yes and we'll have a working group on the 25th so I have a like a IETF process question I suppose mm -hmm. so like once this is all done and you have the current state mm -hmm. I mean VPF's gonna keep moving mm -hmm. are the documents going to be in the kernel and like will we be expected to keep them up to date or if they're not in the kernel where are they coming from um, because like funny you should ask I don't truly really <laughs> want to have to update an IETF draft just to submit a patch right okay great segue I have a plant in the audience thanks John okay so today the status is the RST files are under documentation slash BPF okay um, there is a mirror which is currently a manual mirror meaning I I, I, I sync for one and then I post the other one um, in under eBPF foundation slash eBPF docs um, there is an uh, internet draft skeleton, meaning the thing that puts it into the IETF boilerplate at the top, and there's the show references section at the bottom, the thing that does the transform, okay, um, is sitting in eBPF docs, right? And so it imports stuff from the, from the mirrored portion, does the generation, and out outputs a, an internet draft formatted version with the appropriate boilerplate and acknowledgements at the bottom that says where it came from, and the references section, and that kind of stuff, right? And so I was the one that wrote this tool that's RST to RST XML that does the automated conversion from RST, uh, sorry, from RST into this XML format that then used to generate HTML, so in, in internet drafts, right? Um, our XML is the canonical format and because it automatically derives, you know, HTML and PDF and text all from XML, right? And so this, gener this causes RST to be uh, converted to uh, XML preserving all the different types of markup thing and the appropriate way of doing that so that you get pretty printed, you know, PDFs and pretty printed HTML pages and stuff as a result, okay. Um, and then um, I manually submit the resulting ID sna as a snapshot. It says on a particular date, right, I snapshot whatever the outputted uh, version is there and submit that to the IETF, okay. So that's, how, that's what happens right now, okay. And that's what I did before last IETF. Um, some discussion is... Um, um, well, yes, yes. I have a question, but it's not related to this class. I think you wanted to follow up, right? Uh, I, I'll get to that. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll get to it. Okay. Um, get, but the short version is yes to, to what you said, John. Is yes, what you wanted is the case, so both now and in the future. Um, in the list of um, domains that will fall into this IETF uh, standardization, I saw that I saw ELF there. For example, I don't know what you mean exactly with bindings, ELF bindings there, but I assume that you mean like the BPF specific ELF uh, artifacts, like uh, I don't know, section you types. I, I said ELF profile, stuff. but yes, it's okay. the, the things that are not in there. There's the core ELF spec, okay, and there's the way that you use uh, ELF in BPF, which is like, you know, what th there's a, such a thing as a dot map section, which has, you yeah, know, yeah, I, I, so that's what's in that. That's within the profile. Yeah, yeah I, I understand. What's but the, the magic numbers that go in the header? Right. That has yeah, yeah. But uh, the thing is that, as far as I know, um, well, you know, the ELF specification itself I itself is sort of part of the CIS5 API, right? And as far as I know, this will be the first um, um, ELF derivative being standardized, which is not in a PSA BI. Uh, which is part of the CIS-5. Now, I don't think it makes m much sense for BPF to be in the CIS-5 ABI because clearly it's not a CIS-5 system and it cannot yep. be. Yep. But uh, have you considered that? I mean, because I'm thinking in terms of who is implementing ELF, like Binutils implements ELF, ELF Utils implements it. Uh, I think in the kernel for sure you have like ELF.h, right, somewhere, your own version of it, right? So as far as I can, I mean, this will be, I think, the first time that uh, someone out of the CIS-5 environment will actually ex extend ELF. So, uh, so was it considered? Um, yes, but not for very long. If uh, you think there's a problem, so let us know. To clarify, so yeah. this is not ELF extension. This is how ELF used. Yes. 
So we don't think that there's any problem with it. But by we, I mean the different people that were at the IDF discussions. So if you do, let us know. But as, as Lexi said, this is just a use of ELF. There's no change to ELF per se. What if you need to add in the future? I mean, let's say, like for example, a BPF specific ELF relocation. Will that fall in the in this IETF effort or not? That's what. I mean. If you require a change to the base ELF spec, then you got to go to the other committee. If you can do it without a change to the other ELF spec, and you're just saying here's how you use it, then no. But that's my assumption, though. You tell me if you have a different one. Okay. And do you use ELF in Windows too? Yeah. For BPF. Yep. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to go back and finish answering John's question here. Okay, um, the discussion that came up is um, okay. So right now the mirror is in the EBPF Foundation. It is common practice, not required, but common practice in IETF that there's an IETF repository per working group, or sorry, an IETF organization per working group using the GitHub language, right? Git, you know, GitHub.com/slash you know, IETF working group name. Um, that you have repositories for drafts. You're not required to do it that way, but probably at least half of the working groups do. Not all of them, but at least half of them do do that. Okay. And so um, the suggestion is, rather than sticking it under EBPF Foundation, can't we just move that repository under the IETF working group? Okay. So that's actually the, uh, the proposal there, is just move it over there, uh, because that doesn't touch the kernel tree, right? That's just the mirror, right? You move the mirror over to IETF, that's fine, right? Um, and right now I mentioned that the mirroring process was manual, and gosh, it would be great to automate that. So. Um, the, the automate the mirroring is still a manual snapshot uh, to actually do the draft generation. Right? So it's not like every patch set generates a new internet draft. No, no, no. It's it's every you know milestone like before an IETF meeting or before an interim meeting if there is one that type of stuff. So before some major conference that's relevant, right? Then you snapshot it, put it in internet draft format. I mean, we're, yeah, we're not standardizing through the EBPF Foundation. We, let's just move it to the IETF repo. Yeah, I don't yeah. see any reason not to. Right, right. So before there was some proposal that came up at, I think it was at, LT, uh, at LSFMM BPF a year ago or something, that said, should we standardize it in the, uh, in the EBPF Foundation? Which was an option on the table. And we said, it's really better if we can use IETF, which has a whole distribution mechanism and um, you know, marketing and you know, wide, broad um, audience and so on, rather than the foundation doing it. And the foundation can just deal with uh, marketing and pointing and coordination and things like that. So. All right, so now I mentioned I was going to come back and tell you what the note well says, right? So just if you're interested, right, there's the links to it, okay? Um, now, we said it's going to be most compatible if we don't actually put any code into the docs, right? But we don't do that now, right? We put the docs in the docs, not the code in the docs, right? And so um, to, this is the actual answer to your question, John, to say in the kernel tree, um, the discussion around the IETF note well, which is like how do you, you tag stuff as having the appropriate legal stuff there? Um, the thought was, I mean, if you've got a better idea, but the thought among a couple of us that talked about it is we create another subdirectory underneath BPF documentation, or documentation BPF, like documentation BPF slash, you know, IETF or something like that, right? We move anything that gets derived into an IETF document down a level into that directory, and then you slap some readme-like file in and parallel to it that has the IETF note well in it, right? So it officially tags which documents are the ones that show up in IETF drafts and which ones that don't. Is it problematic that the UAPI header files don't have a BSD license at the top of them? Because um, if you want to pull the helper, the helper notes, right? N none like of them have a document label at the top. That's why we relied on, uh, I should say, the legal review relied on two things. It relied on the uh, BPF license uh, file that's actually in their uh, kernel repository right now that gives the history of the licensing around BPF, which was awesome document according to the, the, the lawyer, that's just what he needed. And separately, um, uh, Alexi's clarifications during the meeting in an email, right? So between those two, he had everything he needed. So um, it, the fact that they didn't explicitly label stuff at the top was not a blocker in any sense, right? The intent and the history document that, that actually covered all the stuff for the I, documentation I, I, purpose was close enough. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, like, for the helpers, were you going to try to pull the descriptions directly from the header files? But it um, looks like they, they have an explicit GPL at the top, so I was just curious how that uh, would work. You're asking about the helpers, and, and, and so. right now, if you go back here, well, that's currently my comment here. Helpers are not on the list. Okay. Yeah, the now, I, I argue that the least helpers for things like map manipulation need to be on the list, right? And, and the ones that are the, help, the map manipulation ones are the things that are not GPL. I think, right? You can verify that, but uh, it, but the point is, if they are, then we might have to rewrite them, right? If but that's not a big deal. Yeah, I mean, look, we're, we're, I think the proposal step is separate 
entire namespace for whatever is going to be standardized, right? Yep. And I don't, we wouldn't be pulling from UAPI headers. Correct. We correct. don't want to be copyright infringing anything. Correct. So it, we would rewrite it correct. if we had. That's the don't allow copying any existing code into such docs. So if something is explicitly labeled GPL, does not get copied in, it could be rewritten if necessary by a different person or something, that's fine. I just don't know of a case we would actually need to do that. If you do, then that would be our, our out there. Okay. I, I mean, yeah, we, we could improve our documentation in general. So we don't need to copy, yeah. uh, copy and paste anything. It, yeah, Daniel's giving me a little time signal, but you know, I, 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 I'm, I, I've got another half an hour later on, and so I'm not done yet, and so I don't know how you want to do that. So, if, if you're trying to end early, because I think uh, I'm happy to stop now if you want. We just move on. So I, um, like we got to a logical stopping point. Say again. We got to a logical stopping point. I so here's yeah, another well. Yeah, it's a logical stopping and, and point. And you can see that's what I've got left. I've got those okay. two slides. That's it. Okay. I mean, if it's a logical stopping point, because now also file system people are here, so Fair we enough. have this cross track, uh, then we can move yeah. this to the end because, like, there's like one session where the presenter didn't show up, yeah. so we yeah. still have some buffer at the end as well. Like I said, I've got okay maybe five you. minutes left, but I'm fine just either skipping mm -hmm. the last five minutes because it's you've gotten through the main part. You've got everybody was asking me what's the status. I've told you the status is hot off the press. You yeah. got that, okay? That's perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Next step Thank is review the charter. All right. Kay. All right, uh, then we continue at the end. All Thank right. you so much. Cool. All right. Um, so the IETF note well. If you haven't seen it before, if you weren't at, I if you were at IETF, you should have seen it lots of times. Okay, But if you haven't seen it before, this is it. Um, and so anything that is a contribution to the IETF, that includes um, things like post to the BPF at IETF.org mailing list. It includes things like uh, comments made during official IETF meetings, of which the side meeting was not one but the BOF was, um, as well as uh, contributions in the form of documents, okay? All fall under note well, okay? And so note well says, you know, you have your basic, um, you know, code of conduct type of stuff that's in there. But the uh, second bullet is unique, and so I just wanted to highlight that one. It says, uh, if you are aware that any IETF contribution is covered by patents or patent applications that are owned or controlled by you or your sponsor, you must disclose that fact or not participate in the discussion. That, that's the one that's kind of in addition to what might be in BSD or whatever, which is uh, not an obligation to uh, go and actually look for anything, right? This is on personal knowledge, not on behalf of your corporation. It says, okay, if you propose a, a change to the, to the documentation that gets accepted, then you're basically saying that according to your personal knowledge, okay, you are not aware of any patents. Okay? We hope that there actually aren't any, that this isn't, isn't a big deal, okay? But if you ever are aware of one, then it just means that you're obligated to say so. That's all. And may I say that if, if a lawyer at your company asks you if a patent is okay and you can still go, basically tell them, don't tell me about it, that's the problem. Yeah. The problem yeah. is when your company tells you about patents you have and you have to disclose them. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, often legal departments will say, don't go and look, right, for those reasons, right? Because it's a personal knowledge um, obligation, not a corporate obligation, okay? So it's not like you got to check with your legal department, oh, do we have any patents? No, don't do that. And in fact, the legal departments, if you have one that have actually looked at this note well, they'll usually say, don't do that, okay? Just do it as your personal knowledge. That's all that's required here. Keep the process lightweight, okay? So when we say we wanted to put the note well into the repo, that's the main thing that's set, that's maybe in addition to what's already there in like the or BSD clause or whatever, okay? And so when people are saying, is this covered by the note well or whatever, that's usually what they're talking about is that clause, okay? We hope that patents are a non-issue, that there aren't anything in this space that would be in any documents or whatever. But when people get into legal discussions about what's the legal process and stuff, that's usually the clause that they're referring to. But again, don't go and look. The IETF does not ask you to go and look, and probably your legal department would not want you to go and look either. This is, are you already aware of something? And most of us say, as far as we know, there's no patents. There's nothing patentable here. It's, open, it's been open for forever, so. Okay, so that's what NoteWell is, and this is the, the text and text format that we'd be proposing be copied in a file that's in parallel to the other files in the kernel tree in that IETF directory. Okay, so that's what the proposal is. Okay, um, separately, um, whenever issues get raised, okay, different working groups follow different processes. This is just my personal input. I'm done with all the rest of the stuff, so if I didn't get to this one, that's fine, okay. Um, it is common practice, but not required, that working groups keep track of some sort of issue tracking so that the chairs can decide whether there's open issues, that the chairs can decide whether there's a consensus achieved, and so on. Many working groups, the chairs choose to use a GitHub issue tracker to do so. 
technically the chairs are, uh, will be Suresh and David, so they get to decide. Since this is not a technical issue, the chairs can just decide. Okay? But they like to decide, usually, based on suggestions from authors or people that actually track things. And so my personal suggestion is, if we're going to use the ITF GitHub repo as the mirror right, for generating the internet draft, let's just use that for tracking issues. And if we want to do it there, then that's fine. So if you want to file an issue and just say, I've got a complaint. This needs to be addressed. I don't have a suggestion yet. This would be a potential way to track it. And then the chairs can just decide when they want to close issues. Do they say that's closed when we merge the patch? Do we wait until the internet draft gets submitted? Or when the chairs look at it and say, yeah, you did the right thing, that's up to the chairs to decide. Okay. But the point is, uh, the first proposal was to move the mirror over from EBP Foundation to ITF. And the second one is maybe use the issue tracker that GitHub provides on that repository. Okay. Not for tracking pull requests, but for tracking actual issues, right? You know, need to be addressed. Okay. And so with that, um, we expect by, you know, knock on wood, that on May 25th or so, unless we ask for a delay based on charter stuff, that we should have a working group. That means that at uh, future IHF meetings, there will be a BPF meeting slot on the agenda. Um, and so the next meetings uh, that are in person, but there's also remote attendance possible, are those dates, San Francisco in July and Prague in November. And so would encourage you all, registration is currently open for the San Francisco one. The early bird rate is there. So if you book it between now and a month from now, you get a cheaper rate. Um, there's still a charge for the remote attendance but it's much smaller if you're gonna do remote. Uh, and that's to cover the costs of like the AV people that are doing the, the streaming, okay, which I appreciate. And so there actually is a charge to get a remote attendance, but it, there's no limit, there's no cap or anything. So uh, would encourage folks to go and uh, register there so you can participate in the IETF meetings. And uh, that's the last thing, like in between the when I sat down when I stood up here again, this is what Dover and the other side, basically the Eric and folks asked me to, uh, to, to, to uh, invite you all to do this. Um, so this one is even hotter off the press than when I got it before, so. All right, Joe. And, and I guess uh, in terms of what may be discussed at any of those given meetings, I presume that in advance, well, presumably when we get a slot, assuming we get a slot, of course, lining up, we, yep. there will be a, an agenda ahead of yep. time so we can be aware, and, and that will be posted on the BPF at IETF mailing yes, list. Yes, yeah. the, the, the BPF at IETF.org mailing list which will then be mirrored to the feature mailing list, right, because it's a member of it. Um, and in fact, the way that the agenda process works is the chairs, meaning uh, Suresh and David, get to control what's on the agenda. That would be their job as chairs. Anybody can request an agenda slot, so if you want to discuss something, then you send the request to them, usually on the list itself, so it's public information. And then they may prioritize them, for example, they could prioritize them by, uh, if you're on this list, right here, right, then you're prioritized over anything that's not on this list. And if you're on this list, then anything higher up on the list is prioritized over things that are lower on the list. That would be a fair level of prioritization, and they can assign time slots and speakers and things. And so it's basically a request for them, uh, sort of like when you submitted your uh, slot proposals for this meeting right here. So that's very similar. Okay. That's it. Any other questions about logistics? Otherwise, again, two invitations. Review the charter text by going to the slide, right? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, when the uh, IETF session is over, typically people take notes of what happened, so you also get a recording of the chat uh, mm -hmm. of the session itself and also of the minutes of what happened, so you yeah. can access that later. Um, and back way back at the beginning when I talked about IETF 116, this proceedings link here, takes you to what Emmanuel's talking about for ITF 116, except I just looked and the recording is there, like the video is there and all the slides and stuff are there, but the minutes haven't been posted for the BPF BOP yet, right? And so there were actually, there's you can actually get to them if you know where to look because they were live, live tracked in like Etherpad and so on, but they're not linked into the proceedings page right now. And so we'd have to like wait for them to create the link or whatever. So like I said, this part is, is new. They just published the proceedings in a couple of minutes links are lagging. So the minutes are there, but they're not on that page right there. If you want to find them like tomorrow, send an email and I'll give you the link. Um, because that, that you can find it on the agenda page, but not on the proceedings page. Go figure. All right. That's what I had. All right. Thank you very much. Hope to see some of you in San Francisco.
I also just double checked the uh, IETF 118 is not overlapping with Linux Plumbers conference. So it's it Linus is Lin or Linus is not. It is not. Linux Plumbers is coming after that. So it yeah, it overlaps with KubeCon, yeah, but Linux Plumbers. Hey, yeah, people were asking me earlier whether it overlaps. I said oh, I got to check the dates and stuff. So thanks for reporting. November 4th through 10th is not the week of LPC. All right, so we have 20 minutes. Is there anything anyone still wants to discuss ad hoc? Otherwise, if not, uh, we can close it here. And at 4 p.m., there will be, like in the lightning talk slot, there will be a summary of, of all the sessions uh, for th from the session leads um, for everyone to attend if you want to. If not, then you're free to go as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's otherwise it. Thank you for organizing this to those who put this together. Thank you, Daniel, for moderating and for AP folks and stuff. Great job. And also, Martin. <laughs> I think it was really fun and useful. So uh, I love to, to do it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, then. That's it. All right. If anyone haven't grabbed the stickers for eBPF or the BPF, do so now because we'll probably take them back. Yeah, if anybody's heading to another location or place that you could advertise BPF, take some and hand them out. People like swag. <laughs> right, we did that at IETF. Take them to any other venue you're going to be presenting at or something.